is today I'm talking about transgender and the church. Can, can you see that I'm excited to talk about this? Well, I actually am excited to talk about it because I feel like I have learnt so much in such a short period of time. Uh, I'm not claiming to be an expert. So, so please don't hear today's presentation as coming from an expert. But I've been listening to experts. And so I'll do my best over part one and part two to talk about how transge what transgender is and how it relates to the kingdom. But, but it's, it comes within the broader topics that we've been talking about is LGTBIQ+. And this week, obviously, we're talking about transgender. And part one today is really about understanding transgender. Okay, so that's my focus. I, it's impossible to get through everything today. Part one is talking, is understanding it. Part two is transgender and the Bible and church. Okay, so... As an introduction, I want us to watch a short video. I just didn't feel right in who I was. I really just thought, oh, am I in the right body? The first time I realized was when she wanted to go out I want to wear a skirt, and I want to wear a, a frilly top, yeah. and I want you to call me her. her. I didn't like boobs. I thought that they would be disgusting on me, and I still have that opinion. I didn't want my period. No, 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 that would just be terrible for me. I would rather have facial hair and chest hair and muscles I'd just rather not have boobs. <laughs> I definitely think I was born transgender. I think that's how transgenderism works. I don't think it's something that you decide to do or you just stumble upon. It's just who you are. So there's nothing new about trans lives. Trans people are everywhere, we always were, and it's perfectly natural to be trans. It's just one of the ways life works on this planet. We're very devoted to a very simple set of ideas. There are two genders and only two genders, and they are so different from each other that we can call them opposite. We talk about the opposite sex. This has very little to do with human reality. There are animals in which females are dramatically different from males. We are not one of those. Take a deep breath and out. Breathe normally for me now. The problem is we create this idea of rigid gender stereotypes. And our whole purpose in life is to essentially live those stereotypes. Uh, if it really hurts, let me know and then I can always stop, okay? Sure. All right. For the vast majority of people, it works. And it does. But for a lot of people, it doesn't. And more people than you think, it really doesn't work. We are assigned gender and gender expectation when we're born. But sometimes the gender assignment doesn't match. The transgender movement is like, it's challenging the most basic thing that we've been led to believe as a society, especially in the Western culture, is that you're just male or female. I always got mistaken for a girl, even when I was just like 11 or 12. Strangers would call me she and her, and I would be really embarrassed because I didn't know what my family was going to think. When I transitioned, I was 15, so when I started to hang out by the pier and stuff and I met older trans women is when it kind of clicked for me. It all made sense. I was kind of pushed into seeing the counselor because I guess the staff at my school just didn't understand what was going on with me. 
I remember her giving me a pamphlet and it said something about being born in the wrong body. But I was like, that really feels like something I can identify with. When I was a child, I identified as female. I was even quite feminine and I was okay with that. But there was always a fluidity for me for when it came to gender. I always felt that I, I could be a girl or I could be a boy. I could be both. Um, and this wasn't something that I necessarily spoke about. And then I grew older, I moved away to university. And it was during that time that I first came out as a lesbian at 21. I knew that my gender identity was changing. It wasn't the same when I was 25. It wasn't the same as when I was 17. I came out as trans at the age of 30, and that was very shocking to a lot of people. But the place that they were coming from was, well, you know, we never, we, in the news, it's only about, it's about young people. Only, you're supposed to know when you're a child. Uh, every single trans person knows when they're a child, not when they're 30. Uh, wow. Yeah, our cats don't do that. They don't? No, except one of them is... The misconceptions are that there's just one story. This person knew when they were a toddler and has always known and was suffering terribly. It's a very simple story. And of course, it's much more complicated than that. For one thing, many people don't know when they're toddlers. Transgender identity can emerge at any point in the life cycle. And we often feel quite pressured into that simple story. I always knew. Transgender or trans can be confusing. Here's just a few of the questions I think when you listen to that video it raises. I is transgender nature or nurture? Is transgender connected to being gay? Does transgender emerge in young childhood or at puberty or, or later in life? Does, it, does transgender move fluidly back and forth between genders? So I, I think, and there's other things that you would have heard in that video if you, re, if you listen to it again. But here's, I think, the starting point for our conversation. We need to resist the temptation to turn off because, like it or not, this is the world we live in. So I, I feel, for many of us, if we watch that on a computer screen, we, we just turn it off. No, I don't agree. I'm just not going to listen to it. I just don't think that we, we can do that. I don't think we can turn it off. I think a better approach is to understand, understand about transgender, some of the complexities of transgender, and then we're able to speak with some conviction on the subject, with, with all our convictions. Here's what's really, really important is that in this transgender discussion, we m need to remind ourselves to see the person. When we're talking about transgender, we're talking about people. We're not just talking about an issue. Because if we just talk about the issue without connecting it with people, we will dehumanise those people who are affected by transgender. You know, we can talk about truth you know, like in this objective way and, and somehow disconnect truth from people and, and, and then we start to, we do start to dehumanise people. I think that, that when you're talking about truth and I think when you're talking about biblical truth, you always need to connect it with people. Sometimes when I listen to Christians talk about transgender, I'm listening to what they're saying and also uh, same-sex attraction. When I, I listen to what they say and, I, and, I, and I, I agree probably with everything that they say, but there's some way that they're engaging with the subject which I feel like is, I, I don't, it doesn't sit right with me. 
And I think because they've disconnected objective truth from people. But biblically, truth is grounded in reality. Uh, Sorry, biblical truth is grounded in relationship. How can I say that? Well, because these are the words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. They're the words of Jesus. Truth is a person. Truth is Jesus Christ. So in some ways, when we look at truth from a biblical perspective, you you don't have objective truth in the sense that it's detached from people because truth is a person. It's Jesus Christ. It's It's in the person of Jesus Christ. So for us to uh, engage in truth about transgender or, or same-sex uh, attraction, anything, we have to continue to remind ourselves that you cannot detach truth from people. We need to keep on looking at people. Okay. Now let's get into understanding what transgender is. So what is transgender? Well, it's, it's an umbrella, umbrella term. So there's, there's lots of things that would be categorised as transgender. But basically, it, it's the various ways someone experiences a difference between their biological sex and their gender. And let, let me explain what I mean by that. So when we're talking about someone's sex, okay, we need to note that humans are sexually dimorphic. They have two distinct biological sexes. One's male and one's female. Biological sex is defined by your reproductive system, your anatomy, your, your... your gen- gen- genetics, your chromosomes, X, X and XY, and your hormones, testosterone and estrogen. So, so when we're talking about the word someone's sex, that's what we're talking about, the biology of it. Now, when we're talking about someone's gender, we're talking about this, the psychological, social and cultural aspects of being male and female. Now, here's where it's really important. In the past, sex, to say talk about someone's sex and someone's gender, those terms were used interchangeably. So they were the same thing. Not today. When you're talking about this today, they're, they're distinct. Sex, biological, gender, the, the psychological, social, and cultural aspects. And sexual, uh, sorry, gender identity is our internal sense of self as being male or female, or actually, in this discussion, non binary. Uh, uh, that is either gender fluid. Uh, the, one, one of the people in that video uh, identified as being um, gender fluid or, or pan gender. Now, gender dysphoria, which is a really important word to understand in this discussion. It used to be known as gender identity disorder. And gender dysphoria is the distress a person feels when their internal sense of self, their gender identity doesn't match their biological sex. Okay. So, i.e., their internal self experiences, their, their internal self experiences life as the opposite sex to their biological sex. Here's an example. Let's say I am a biological woman and I want to be a man. 
I, I've never resonated with feminine attributes or behaviors. I connect with masculine characteristics and behaviors. Or, here's another example, I'm a bi biological man, but I'm a woman. My internal experience of, of life is as a woman. They're just two examples of what would be classified as transgender. Here's a couple of other ones. Repressed homophobia. Let me explain what that is. Let, let, let's say I, I, I have same-sex attraction. Let's say um, I'm a guy and I'm sexually attracted to guy, to, to other men. Internally, I hate that. I hate, I hate being gay. I, I don't like gays. It, you could say I'm homophobic. So, I want to be a woman. So, I can have a relationship with a guy. That's repressed homophobia. Here's, here's another one, repressed misogyny. So, I'm, let's say I'm born a woman... But I don't like women. I think they're weak. I think they're inferior. I, 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 I want to be a man. Repress misogyny. Do you, do you see the complexity of, of this whole transgender category? There's lots of different types of transgender. If you've heard one story of transgender, you've heard one story of transgender. Okay, now let's, let's talk about the, the different um, types of gender dysphoria. The first one is early onset gender dysphoria. It can happen as young as, as three-year-old. It can, it can be low-level dysphoria or it can be intense, it can be severe. Interestingly, the available studies reveal that 61 to 88% of dys gender dysphoria goes away before puberty. Very interesting. But of the gender dysphoria that continues through puberty, so it started early on in childhood and it's continued through, the available studies show that it continues. And you've got late or adolescent onset gender dysphoria. So obviously it's those who don't experience gender dysphoria in early childhood. What's really interesting is that, that it, those people who experience late or adolescent onset gender dysphoria usually identify as same-sex attracted. Now, here's another category, and I have to say this is very controversial in the discussion of transgender. It's, it's something called rapid onset gender dysphoria, and it's only been termed this over the last few years. It's where someone has identified as transgender or having gender dysphoria suddenly without prior warning. Okay, so they're typically teenagers, sometimes young adults, and they've been influenced by their social environment to identify as transgender. Now, now this when when you hear Christians or the church talking about gender dysphoria, they're mostly talking about this area of transgender. This rapid onset gender dysphoria has increased massively in the last 10 years. Let me just show you some statistics from a place called Tavistock Centre in London. It's a gender clinic in the NHS, okay, which is the, the uh, National Health Service in the UK. 
So, in 2009, they treated 51 people with gender dysphoria. 34 male, 17 female. In 2016, they treated 1,766, 557 male and 1,209 female. In 2019, they treated 2,364 people. 624 were male and 1,740 were female. Interesting, isn't it? There was a peer-reviewed study on rapid onset gender dysphoria in 2018. And, and, you know, when something's peer-reviewed, it has credibility. And this study surveyed 256 parents with kids uh, who, who would be categorised in, in the area of uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, uh, of these kids, 83% were female, which is consistent with the statistics that we just saw there. And this is what the study found. The trans identity appeared out of the blue. So remember, this is in uh, more than likely... Uh, children in their teenage years, perhaps young adults, but mainly in their teenage years. Few children showed any signs of gender dysphoria growing up. All or most of the kids' friends identified as transgender. Many became more popular after becoming transgender. They engaged in heavy online and social media activity related to their coming out as transgender. Here's something really interesting. Many had other mental health concerns that weren't being dealt with. 63% of the 256 had one or more, more diagnosed diagnosed psychiatric disorders or neurodevelopment disabilities before their gender dysphoria. And what's really interesting, if you, if you looked, if, when, when they surveyed the parents, 86% of the parents affirmed same-sex marriage, 88% of the parents affirmed uh, transgender rights. So they weren't doing a survey in an Amish community or a really conservative religious community. Most of these parents affirm same-sex relationships and transgender rights. You've got to pause there and ask the question, what's going on? Now, we, we're looking at rapid onset gender dysphoria. Here's, here's what some of the conclusions I think that you can reasonably draw from this. Now, this is a snapshot. I, I haven't been able to include lots of detail, and there is lots more detail. I think, you know, clearly gender dysphoria is real. It's genuine. Their internal sense of self is different to their biological gender. I, I don't think anyone can deny that it is real for some people. But what's also true is most childhood, early onset, gender dysphoria goes away. In that, in that uh, I think it was 63 to 81%. Rapid onset gender dysphoria seems to be strongly influenced by social factors. They call this social contagion and it's behaviour, emotions or conditions spreading spontaneously through a group or social network. It's where suddenly someone identifies as well, 
biologically I'm a man, but I, I feel like I'm a woman. And it's just come out of nowhere. Transitioning, and just so you understand transitioning, it's a process. Transitioning from one gen to another includes socialising, so, so dressing like the other, another, the other gender, um, changing your name, all those sorts of things. Um, taking puberty blockers for those who have yet to reach puberty. Hormone therapies, which uh, put, uh, you know, testosterone or estrogen in, in you know, um, into someone. And also reassignment surgery. So that's what I mean by transitioning. For children and teens, based on the available research, research should be treated very cautionately. From an ethical standpoint, it's probably very unwise or even morally unethical. So if you look and engage with those sorts of statistics, to, to suggest to someone pre-puberty that they should start to transition is highly questionable. Let's look ahead 20 years. I, I don't want to be flippant. I don't want to be flippant, and I might cut this out of the video. <laughs> but, you know, I see some parallels with tattoos. Do, do, you, do, you, do anyone remember when tattoos weren't fashionable? But now, they're fashionable. Becoming transgender, in some sense, is fashionable. To come out as transgender in your teens. But here's the thing, regardless, we need to see those suffering with transgender, we need to see them as people precious and loved by God. People that are precious and loved by God. If you've heard one transgender story, you've only heard one transgender story. We can't assume, we can't assume what their story is and what they mean by transgender. Because it can be very different. I mean, that video shows that there's different understandings and people feel differently about their, their transgenderness, their, their gender dysphoria. So really, that's just a, a snapshot of what the conversation is. So here's some questions. If someone experiences a difference between their internal sense of self and their biological se sex, which one determines who they are? Which one determines who they are? Does their biological sex determine that they are male or female or does their internal sense of self? And how does God see them? How does God see them? Does he look at their, their biological sex or does he take account of their internal sense of self? As a Christian, what do we do with transgender? As Christians, to be continued in part two. So he, here's, here's what I recommend that we all do. We, we start to think about transgender and the, the, the largeness of the conversation. We, we, if we thought transgender was just one understanding from those um, identifying transgender, we need to widen our understanding of it. We need to just also engage with the fact that these are people. And 
when I listen to, to those who talk about uh, uh, their gender dysphoria or their identification as transgender, what's consistent is none of them, well, none of them seem to want to be transgender. See them as people and, and, and mostly they didn't choose to feel this way, whatever the reason. So when we do that, we humanise people and I think that's the way that Jesus would have engaged with them. Part two, I'm obviously going to engage with the Bible and what I think the biblical um, understanding would be. And we have to acknowledge that the Bible doesn't directly address transgender. So we have to look at the Bible in a way and, and come to some conclusions. And so, but, but when we do that, we need to continue to remember that these are people, these are people's lives mostly uh, a sense of self that people didn't choose or will willingly choose. So let's go into that more in part two. Let me just pray to finish. Father, I thank you that...